The next unit in this module on motivation and engagement is a short introduction of self-determination theory developed by Deci and Ryan. This theory uh, was originally developed in the 70s and 80s of the last century. So you might say that it has a firm basis in uh, the cognitive perspective. It is about the individual student uh, who develops, let's say, a healthy and strong position um, by, uh, let's say, uh, reacting on, on external rewards which help the student to develop autonomy, relatedness and competence. So uh, it is definitely not a behaviorist approach because in, according to the behaviorists there is simply the, ex the situation or the, there are the conditions of external rewards and reinforcements and here there are basic needs uh, and there is intrinsic motivation and there is also extrinsic motivation and uh, uh, these are all important factors in the development of a strong and healthy uh, student, so to speak. So there is definitely an, a, a lot of attention to internal processes, but it is the individual student who reacts, in fact, on external um, uh, rewards provided by the social uh, context in which a student operates. Okay, so um, let's try to, to, let's say, discuss the basic, uh, the basic components of self-determination theory, the basic needs, and then the way intrinsic motivation uh, can be fostered, the way uh, uh, self-regulation and extrinsic motivation operate, and then uh, the way in which uh, students gradually develop from an extrinsic, uh, let's say, drive to an intrinsic motivation and an application, the last point, on uh, an analysis of, of profiles of teacher, uh, teachers fostering autonomy and providing structure. Okay, the first uh, step, the basic needs. Now it's clear that Deci and Ryan, oh yeah, I must uh, uh, um, just notice that this um, uh, introduction is based on a paper by Deci and Ryan, Self-Determination Theory and uh, the Facilitation of Intrinsic Motivations, Social Development and Well-Being, which was originally published in the, Orig in, in the American Psychologist. An interesting paper, just a very, let's say, uh, 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 um, um, condensed introduction into self-determination theory. Okay. Um, let's see whether we can focus on the three basic needs. So the idea is uh, we were talking about uh, basic physiological needs, but here we, we definitely uh, focus on, on psychological needs, um, which are an important, let's say, basis for uh, the way students develop uh, uh, intrinsic motivation. Uh, first of all, the need uh, for competence, so the, the, they need to feel in, uh, 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 secure about your own uh, capacities to, f to experience mastery, which is an important, I think, uh, d drive for students. Which, so they want to develop competence and that's the reason why they can be influenced uh, to further uh, strengthen their feelings of competence. Okay. Uh, this, uh, the, the second psychological need is relatedness, being connected to others, uh, an important need which is also active in the field of, of course, of, of motivation in education. So students want to be related all, not only to peers, but also to the teacher who provides, uh, let's say, academic support, but also um, um, social support, which is an important let's say, um, um, means for the teacher to, um, to uh, get the students engaged in the whole academic process in which they are working. Uh, 
Okay, and then the, the third uh, basic need is the need for autonomy, the need to be in control, to, to have an internal locus of, of control and to act according to one's uh, self schema, as it is called, so uh, one's values which are together, uh, let's say, organized in, 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 a, in a general self schema or also in, in more specific self schemata related to subject matter areas. Now, uh, Detschi and also Martin van Steenkist, uh, uh, our uh, colleague from Ghent University, who has done a lot of work in the domain of self-determination theory, they emphasize that autonomy does not mean independence. So it's not a matter of being completely independent, uh, not connected to or not related to other students, because there's also this basic need uh, for relatedness. Autonomy means that you act according to your own values, to according to your own self schema, uh, which uh, f makes you feel strong uh, and 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 uh, grounded in in your own, let's say, points of departure. So that is what f autonomy implies. Now these three basic needs are, uh, let's say, the basis on which. Uh, motivation in education uh, is further developed uh, by external uh, support. Now, um, uh, Detsch and Ryan have, uh, uh, let's say, paid, paid a lot of attention to in the, the uh, factors fostering intrinsic motivation, factors fostering extrinsic motivation, and how they, the, bo these, these both types of motivation are interrelated. First, um, intrinsic motivation, which is seen so as, as, as the better sort of motivation. Uh, you might uh, argue about that, whether that's the case. You might, you might think, you might, uh, uh, like Pintridge did, uh, consider at extrinsic motivation or a performance orientation as a sound and solid basis for uh, being active in education, in learning. Uh, 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 as long as this extrinsic or this performance orientation, goal orientation is, is not focused on uh, avoiding uh, failures or on coping strategies, but really is focused on doing uh, everything which helps you to attain the goals you've set, uh, uh, whether they be uh, extrinsic or intrinsic. Okay. So uh, intrinsic motivation as a very important source of, of, of acting, of, of learning, in fact, of being active in educational settings. Now, you can imagine that feedback and external rewards do help uh, students to develop, develop feelings of com competence uh, when they are rewarded in, in, an intrins uh, in, an, in an, let's say, uh, uh, meaningful way not just by uh, emphasizing that uh, students have been have been working very hard but that they actually did the right thing and that they actually developed uh, uh, mastery that contributes to their feelings of competence which helps them to develop a strong uh, positive motivation uh, but it is important that this kind these kinds of feedback and rewards are provided uh, um, in a situation where the student really feels uh, autonomous, so uh, feels an internal uh, uh, locus of control. That is important because otherwise you can imagine, we have been talking about attribution, that students do in fact attribute the positive outcomes of their uh, learning efforts to external courses so that the rewards and uh, the positive feedback does not, uh, does not uh, uh, let's say, uh, strengthen their own feelings of competence, but actually makes them believe that, that the influence of others have be, has been very uh, beneficial, uh, which uh, really uh, actually led to this positive learning outcome. So you have to feel an internal uh, uh, locus of control in order to benefit from um, uh, feedback and rewards, which do, do help you to develop further feelings of competence. Of course, there are many factors which actually uh, diminish uh, intrinsic motivation, threats, deadlines are examples. Uh, these, these things exist and they may 
try to, to put you down, so to speak, whenever you uh, are not able to meet them. So when, 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 when a deadline is passing, it may, in fact, diminish your feelings of uh, intrinsic motivation and may, has, and may have a, de a detrimental effect on, on, on further uh, uh, efforts being invested in a learning task. Um, so the, 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 there are positive and there are negative uh, conditions in the environment. Um, I was struck by this particular sentence in the paper by Deci and Ryan I mentioned in the American Psychologist, which says that both security and maternal autonomy support predicts more exploratory behavior in the infant. Uh, in, in, interestingly, because um, as a matter of fact, uh, my, my wife and I were, were happy to be grandmother and grandfather recently. So our first granddaughter was born uh, and I, I made a picture of her uh, when she was 12 uh, to two months old. So that's about uh, one month ago now. Um, you can see here that she is really a very actively and, and, and goal-directedly exploring her environment. Um, but uh, she does so on the shoulder of her mother, who gives her, of course, a, a strong feeling of, of security and who actually also very much encourages her to, to be autonomous. Uh, autonomous. So these, these, this is a sort of picture, you know, illustrating the statement um, which I just showed. Um, that security and maternal autonomy support predict more exploratory behavior in the infants. Well, I think they are completely right. Well, I have at least one example which shows that this really is the case. Okay, now we go to the, to, to the, 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 the topic of extrinsic motivation and self-regulation. In fact, there is a picture here in, in the paper in the American Psychologist which, which does the work and uh, what, what I'm going to do is try, and, try and to, 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 to guide you a bit uh, through this picture. I, I will have to move my face a little bit in order to make the picture a better understandable. So let's do it like that. Uh, what you see here is um, uh, a, a, a couple of, you know, uh, 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 circles. Uh, but there is also a movement from, from, from left to right. Uh, left is non-self-determined uh, and right is self-determined. And that's the story. Uh, uh, right, uh, at the right of, the, of, of this figure you see intrinsic motivation and intrinsic regulation. In the middle you see extrinsic motivation with various types of regulatory styles. Uh, and uh, on the left, we have the situation of a uh, motivation and non-regulation. Well, let's be short about that. That's a very uh, unfortunate situation. And uh, the dashed line does indicate that it's very difficult to cross the border here. So we will not focus on this kind of non-intentional, non-valuing um, um, and a feeling of incompetence and lack of control situation, which is a very, very, very unfortunate. But uh, the, the, the theory the, the, the explaining what uh, and extrinsic motivation is does focus on, on the center of this figure. Okay, so we see here that uh, as, as students uh, have an extrinsic motivation uh, these students do uh, are active in education because of the fact that that they are rewarded or that they receive a, a, all kinds of reinforcements which help them to 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 be uh, uh, to stay on task, but not because of the fact that they want it uh, themselves, but that they feel forced to do so by external uh, forces. That's that's the idea. Okay. Uh, a completely external regulation, uh, we are now uh, moving, uh, so we are on the left, uh, the first step on the left, uh, extrinsic motivation and, and, and a regulatory style which is uh, characterized by external regulation. In this situation, the student does indeed feel, does not feel an internal locus of control, but an external locus of control. The student actually wants to comply with the, the prescriptions and the guidance of the teacher, uh, and there are external rewards and punishments 
um, uh, which help the student to uh, actually comply. Uh, that's the situation. So the teacher says you have to do di this and that. The students, the student actually uh, completes the task, not because of the student, uh, not because of a, a sort of personal motivation to do so, but but because the student feels uh, uh, enforced by the teacher to do so. Okay, so that is a situation which, in in terms of Dutch and Ryan, is not very favorable. Uh, we may move one step further and we can see that, that students in fact develop a sort of intro, interna, internalized or interjected regulation as Dutch and Ryan uh, are calling it. And there we see the first signs of, of, of internal, uh, uh, an internal locus of control, uh, but not very much so. Uh, so there is some uh, self-control, there is some ego involvement, but uh, the rewards and punishments are still a very important uh, motivating force and they are internalized. So you, you feel, you know, the teacher uh, uh, warning you that you have to complete the task when you're sitting at your desk at home um, and, and uh, uh, asking yourself whether you would do your homework or prefer to, to do a computer game or whatever. Now, well, then the teacher shows up, you know, warning you that if you don't complete your homework, then there will be uh, a big trouble the next morning in school. So there is a first sort of internalized, interjected, as uh, Dutch and Ryan call it, uh, a regulation. That may move on uh, to uh, uh, what, what uh, they call identified regulation. So there is some internal control here. Uh, there is a, an acknowledgement of personal importance, conscious valuing of the, the rules of the, the advice of the regulations and prescriptions by the teacher. So the student's, student follows up on these uh, prescriptions and assignments by the teacher because of the fact that the student uh, considers them as a valuable and, and worth following up. Uh, so there is now an identified regulation, um, which may further uh, be uh, integrated in what, what Dutch and Ryan call an integrated regulation, where there is a really a synthesis with the self and there is a, a, a congruence with the personal uh, you know, values and aspirations and the, the, the norms which have, have been um, uh, uh, propagated by the teacher uh, and have been uh, uh, taken over by the student. So an integrated regulation here. There is internal, uh, a perceived internal locus of control, uh, but the, the rules, well, they originate from outside, so to speak. Okay, so these are the various, you know, levels of extrinsic motivation um, uh, which uh, Dutch and Ryan distinguish, and as you see on the right, there is the intrinsic motivation and, and the fully in intrinsic regulation, uh, and a, a really internally felt locus of control, interest, enjoyment, inherent satisfaction. So that's the so, so, sort of paradise in in in, uh, in learning, so to speak. So you can see that there is a gradual movement within l these uh, this area of extrinsic motivation towards a more internal control. Okay. Okay, let me just try to move again to the corner. Okay, um, well, this is again, well, the same process, in other words. So, how do we move from extrinsic to intrinsic motivation? Uh, a first and important observation by Dutch and Ryan is that external support may. Uh, contribute to feelings of relatedness. Here does relatedness come into play, so to speak. Um, as you can see here, children who had more fully internalized the regulation of pos for positive school-related behaviors were those who felt securely connected to and cared for by their parents and teachers. So, so these students felt related, felt securely related, uh, securely attached, if you like, and therefore they were able to internalize these external rules. So th this relatedness needs external support and it may, uh, further on, this relatedness, this feeling of relatedness, contribute 
to a more stable internalization of external regulations. That's the basic idea. So you can do something as a teacher by, 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 uh, by uh, uh, you know, uh, providing comfort to the students. Uh, you, you can do something to help them to internalize the rules, the regulations. An interesting point of view, I think, um, because uh, in, 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 let's say, in situations of conflict, conflict teachers tend to become more harsh and strengthen, you know, the rules and regulations without, you know, providing support for relatedness. So this relatedness issue might be an important, let's say, bridge uh, which helps the teacher to enforce, uh, if you if you like, uh, regulations, rules, prescriptions, etc., to the students. Okay, uh, as we already discussed, external support uh, might also contribute to, to feelings of competence and uh, competence. You know, expectancy is a very important determinator of of mot being motivated to carry out a, a task. And as we already discussed. Uh, uh, internal perceived locus of control is a necessary precondition in order to to benefit from this external support um, by increasing you know your your feelings of mastery your feelings of competence and again as we already discussed autonomy isn't is not the same as individualism or independence it's really autonomy in in a in a setting of feeling related it's it's autonomy is is acting according to your own values. That's autonomy, and that may very well be done in a secure, in a, in a socially secure situation in, in which you feel related to other students. Okay. So I hope you have a, a first idea of the important concepts which together form the theoretical network of self-determination theory. There is a lot more to say about that because people have been working, a very large group of, of, of researchers have been working in this domain. Uh, also, as I already mentioned, Martin van Steenkis and other colleagues from uh, Ghent University. Um, what they did in this particular uh, study, and I, I just provided here as an example, is they, they, they uh, asked students and teachers uh, to what extent the teachers provide autonomy support and to what extent the teachers provide clear expectations and goals, etc. Of course, uh, I have to be more precise in, in, in the way, you know, explaining the way they did this, but th we have, don't have the time for that. Uh, interestingly, uh, there were four uh, gr groups of teachers, and those teachers to the right, the group number four here in this picture, who did provide autonomy support and who did provide clear expectations, were of course the more the teachers with with uh, uh, the, the best results as far as the students were concerned. Whereas group number three, of course, with no autonomy or a very uh, small amount of autonomy support and no clear expectations, did uh, a, a, a far a less better job. So, so, so in in in, in indeed these 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 teachers can be distinguished, can be recognized by their students, and they, in fact, have a sort of combination of um, supporting the autonomy of the, of the students also by providing a, a, a safe and secure situation and by, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, encouraging them to explore their environment. But they also provide clear expectations uh, and this combination is also, yeah, well, is, is an important combination. I remember uh, having been uh, in a present, uh, uh, having been attended a presentation by one of the PISA uh, people from uh, the OECD in Paris, uh, in which uh, they explained uh, the, the, the differences between uh, academic outcomes between various countries. Uh, as, as you probably know the Netherlands has a, a rather uh, favorable situation, but there are other countries which have even better results. And it, it's interesting to see the, which countries do come up, we, we do rise on this uh, sort of ladder. Uh, you may discuss the, the value of, of, of the PISA norms, but let's not do that for the moment. The in interesting thing is that um, um, that the, the, the author um, or the, the presenter uh, emphasized that a country like 
Poland, Poland uh, does indeed have a situation in which secondary education is provided with very clear expectations laid down in the law about you know the outcomes which has to be produced, the end terms, but there is also a lot of uh, freedom, uh, 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 professional freedom, so to speak, in the way these outcomes can be attached, can, can be uh, achieved, attained, and uh, so you you might say that uh, in the PISA context, uh, the combination of autonomy, support, and clear expectations is in f- fact a success formula as far as uh, academic outcomes of secondary school students uh, is concerned. Interesting. Okay, so uh, now we have had a first sort of, you know, uh, uh, first introduction in self-determination theory, and you may use this sort of basis to further explore the concept within this theory, which may be helpful in your own research.